anything. So Jonathan, why don't we kick it off and you can just kind of, maybe some people have watched your session, maybe they haven't, but just kind of give everybody a brief overview of who you are so that they're new to you or. Sure. Actually, I'd like to do something a little bit different. I'd like to start with a check-in round, which is a, um, a, a process that we do a lot in Holacracy. And it's just, it's just a quick hello from each person to say kind of like who you are and how you're doing and get present, see if anything is kind of in the way of, of your attention. Um, I can start. So yeah, I'm, I'm Jonathan. Uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm excited to mess with your process a little bit here. Um, and I've been doing Holacracy for four and a half years. I was a partner at Holacracy One, which is the company that kind of defined the system. And I just fell in love with it. I just, I can't imagine um, doing things differently. Um, it's sort of like, it's sort of like Agile. It's like once you taste that way of working, you don't want to, you don't want to change. Um, right. So yeah, I'm here in Madison. It's a beautiful day. And um, that's it for me. Tom, do you want to do a quick check-in? Sure, sure. My name's Tom Henriksen. I am the, I guess, the founder of the Agile Online Summit. I'm here in uh, Newtown, Pennsylvania, Eastern Pennsylvania. So near kind of north of Philly, if you will, northeast of Philly. So I'm doing well today. I don't have anything. Um, I will turn off my phone. So Jonathan, that's a good reminder. I try to turn off my phone on a lot of these because I don't want any digital distractions. So I will shut that off. But I am doing well and enjoying the summit, enjoying all the uh, great people, a lot of great um, discussion. So I'll let, uh, if Cindy, do you want to go next? Sure. I'm Cindy Cook. Uh, I'm with Insperity in Houston, Texas. Well, specifically a suburb named Kingwood. And I don't think there's anything distracting me. I think I'm fully present. Sweet. Tim? Yeah, hi. I'm uh, Tim Nolan, uh, Collin County, Texas. So we do have like almost half the people here are from Texas. So, uh, <laughs> and I'm up in the Dallas, Fort Worth area. I'm just, uh, Collin County is just, just north of Dallas. Uh, I, I work for the county government. So uh, I'm, I'm always on the search, always on the lookout. So Tom, let me know if you know or anyone in your list that's a, uh, a local government agilist, I, I wanna know them. And uh, so we've been doing this since, uh, we've been ad trying to be agile since 2011 and our most, uh, recent experiment, which I believe was a success, was we uh, attempted a, a mob programming to kind of bolt on an application on top of a, a COTS product that seems to be working. So cool. fingers crossed. I don't know if y'all can see my camera, but yeah. But that was, uh, we, we tried mob programming for the first time. And awesome. We really, really liked it. Yeah. Nice. And Martin, do you want to check in? Welcome back to Martin. Kyle, uh, we're just doing quick intros, check in, say how you're doing, um, anything that's on your mind. Do you wanna check in? I see you unmuted, but we still can't hear you. And now you're back on mute and now you're off. Yeah. Well, um, I'm just uh, joining this for the first time. So I'm just trying to see what the conversation's like. Great, welcome. Martin, do you want to try again to check in? I'm gonna assume that's a no. Okay, we can get started. Um, thanks for uh, humoring me there with the check-in round, guys. It's just a really nice little uh, ritual I like to do. Um, so yeah, I've been doing Holacracy for several years and um, it's changed me both internally and it's also changed the way I work. <clears throat> and I'm happy to answer any questions people might have. I'd be curious to hear what's been your exposure to Holacracy or what have you heard? Good things, bad things? Anyone's welcome to jump in. Yeah, I got a comment. I mean, yeah, so I was at the Agile 2019 conference and I saw, uh, saw a session with Sandy Mamali uh, from uh, Nomad 8 and she gave her a session on Holacracy. So it was, that was my introduction to it. I'd never heard of it. If I recall, I mean, guess I'm sure Jonathan, you're going to talk a lot more about this, but it was like you, like you said, it was a change in the way people were used to working and uh, their experience ultimately was they liked it, it, but it took a little while, right? It, it was, you know, it, it kind of took them a while to get there. I think if I recall, there's uh, bubbles or, or groups or circles, circles, circles. circles that you, yeah, that you get into and, and you try to get a, a cross section, but here, I'm, 
I'm still in your thunder. You tell us all about it. No, please. I, I, it's it's great to hear. It. It's great to hear it. And this is fine if it's just a back and forth conversation. I'm I'm all about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I could I could sit here and ramble about the, all the the functionality and details of the actual process. Um, but yeah, there are circles. They're kind of like teams. Um, and when you're when people when holacracy is generally being taught, it's usually like we we don't want to call them teams. We we don't want to call the circle lead a manager. That's kind of like what they are, but there are distinct differences. Mm -hmm. um, one of the big differences is sort of a push versus pull, which you know we talk about in Agile and having teams pull things off the backlog as opposed to getting work pushed at them. Um, one way that shows up is that you're in uh, in Holacracy, you're not allowed to make a demand of someone. You can, I mean, you can do it. You can do whatever you want, but um, instead of doing that, you ask you would ask a question. You would say. Hey, does it make sense for your role to do X, Y, Z? Um, and we have explicit roles and those roles are dynamic. They change. And what's great about that is that if I hear, if somebody asks me to do something and I have a role that, that's, that cares about that work, I can say, yeah, yeah, that makes sense to my role. Or, you know what? That doesn't make sense to me. You have no right to expect that from me. Um, but I can help you find the role that can help you or... If you would like the right to expect it, we can go to a governance meeting and create a role, and I, I might be happy to fill that role. But it really depersonalizes a lot of um, it depersonalizes things in some in a really healthy way. I think. Um, yeah. And I think it's particularly useful outside of what we think of as conventional development circles. You know, um, I said this, uh, this when I was talking to Tom earlier, I think, that, I think that Agile teams have it pretty good. Like we have good rules, we have good process and structure, but like 95% of the world is still just ambling around in the dark, trying to figure out how to work together and, you know, using politics and whatever else, whatever mechanisms they need, whatever they can do to get their work done. Uh, so I just think it's really civilized. Even if you can only apply a part of this process, it can really change the way uh, teams work and ultimately how people work. Um, and if any, anyone's welcome to jump in again, I, I'll just sit here and fill the air. Tom? Hey, Jonathan, just to kind of dovetail on that, have you seen a, an application of democracy in a, a government agency, government um body yeah like uh, i believe it was tim was talking about yeah so um michael d'angelo is a name you should know um he's actually a partner at holacracy one now so he's working in in holacracy one on doing this work in the world um and you can probably go actually i, can, I bet i can bring up uh some of his info here um if you want yeah that you can share stuff in the there's chat here in um you know what? I'll do you one. If you want to do that. I'll do you one better here. I'm going to do a screen share. Cool. Can you see my screen? Yep. So I'm going to go to GlassFrog. Um, this is the tool that Holacracy One has for managing your Holacracy. And, you know, just like some people use Pivotal Tracker to manage their backlogs or whatever, uh, GlassFrog is great for actually managing the organization structure. And there's a lot of governance records. There's a lot of detail. You can see over here on the right-hand side, the structure of H1. Um, I know Michael D'Angelo is involved in Glassfrog. I think he's the lead link. Yep, so here's Michael. I'm gonna click on him. And so what you can see here is all of the circles and roles that Michael D'Angelo is involved in. And here, I'm gonna copy this link. These are public links. Uh, H1, oh, okay. H1 publishes their stuff so anyone can see it, including all the policies and details. But um, I bring up Michael D'Angelo because he used to work with the Washington State Technical Department, WATEC. And uh, WATEC did a Holacracy transformation and they started doing all of their processes according to Holacracy. So th there actually is precedent for state agencies to be doing work with Holacracy. Had you heard of that before, Tim? Uh, I have not. Um, but yeah, I'm always interested. Like I said, to me, the, my my about two months ago is when I even heard of Holacracy. So uh, I sort of glanced through it on, on uh, you know, articles and such, but uh, it wasn't until I went to a session and now Jonathan's kind of explaining, giving me a little better, better understanding. Yeah, and um, what else can I say for you, Tim? Um, people think that it's all about democracy and meritocracy and you know, no rules. It couldn't be further from the truth. Um, you know, if, 
holacracy is great because it makes it really clear who has the authority and who has the accountability. Um, and so I think it's super safe to try in a government environment. It's, it's just different. Now, one thing that, that I noticed or that I kind of sensed when, when uh, I was uh, attending Sandy's talk was uh, this seems to work with a big organization. You know, I mean, can you just have one circle? I mean, I only have a team of eight. You know, is that, can, can that totally. work? Okay. Because this, the, the notion of self-organizing seems great to question. be kind yeah. of on, amped up with this because now you can join different circles or take on different roles. Um, but we don't really have that option, right? The team is the team. There's only one team and you're it. You know, I hope you like each other. <laughs> right. Well, for now, you guys are still, we call it role fusion. You, you are fused to your roles. The, the person yeah. is the role. Um, as soon as you start practicing holacracy, um, there's what's called separation of role and soul. And role and soul. So I should say that again because it's pretty important. Separation yeah. of role and soul. Um, and what that means is that you energize your roles and you care for your roles, um, but you are not your role. And that also depersonalizes things. But yeah, to answer you, you can totally do a, a circle of one or one, you know, in fact, yeah, you can do, you can do a circle um, that just has an organization that just has one circle. Um, and you'll do your tactical meetings and your governance meetings. And that works just fine. Um, in fact, Eight, eight people in a circle is actually pretty big, and you might find yourself differentiating. Um, you're, are, are you technical in nature, the, the work of that circle? No, not really. I've been in management too long to remember how to do stuff. So, uh... What I'm saying is the work of the circle primarily like development. Yeah, really? okay. yeah, yeah I'm involved in, the, you know, like, like I said, we're a scrum team, so I'm in you know, story development. And, you know, awesome. Awesome. I, I kind of, you know, kind of help sell what we're doing around. Do you have any kind of um, like customer service type of roles that provide service to other, like that, like answer questions when things go sideways with the app or anything? Yeah, I mean, because we have such a small team, you know, we and and we've done this a while that we sort of have developed a relationship with our business, our customers, which generally are elected officials. And they'll just swing by or have staff swing by and we, you know, we're on, we're co-located, right? So they just go upstairs and come talk to us. So in that regard, you know, but we still mostly have like a sprint review and that's when we really get to see the customer gets to see what we've been doing. So I'm sure we can do a little bit better, but go ahead. So okay, yeah, I was just going to tell you a story. So when I first started at Holacracy One, um, you know, four years ago, there was a, there was glass frog circle and the glass frog web circle did not exist. Okay. So you can see here we have like requirements person, release coordinator, professional services steward, uh, retreat person, and I'm saying person, they're really roles. Um, and one person might fill half of these, you know, like yep. you always have more roles. Um, but one day, one of the guys was saying, he was, he was sensing a tension. He was feeling a difference between how it is and how it could be. And he said, you know what, we have these meetings and we have all of these non-technical customer service people and, you know, I don't know what else, support people and compliance people that are in these meetings. And we're sitting here talking about, you know, what's the best way to structure this data structure or something. Mm -hmm. And so he brought a proposal to a governance meeting and said, I want to create a circle and I want to put these roles in the circle. Um, and that was a boy, that was a heavy duty governance meeting because we were creating a new circle, but it worked and they're, they're still doing it. You can see there's glass frog web. Now, if we click into it, we can see now we've got UX designer, security developer. We call it agilator. I used to fill the agilator. That's like our scrum master. Um, and so this is an example of, yeah, you, you start with a, a small team and then you realize, Hey, we can actually differentiate and, and serve ourselves and our customers better. Um, and even if you don't do the whole governance process, tactical meetings, all that, if you actually, I would, I would recommend doing the tactical component because I think there's a ton of value there. But again, agile teams have it pretty good already. Like, it, I think it really comes down to what, what are the tensions, what are the issues that you're personally sensing that could, that you think could be improved. And that can be rhetorical or not. You're welcome yeah. to answer that question. Well, I, I do have, in the spirit of ask anything, 
you know, because we're such a small team and because this was such a radical change for us, this you know, notion of not, not having these big Gantt charts projects and things and actually delivering quickly. I've, I've run into this issue where, and this is maybe just my observation, uh, that the customers aren't asking us to do anything deeper and so the team has kind of become lackadaisical, right? They're, they're, I know we can improve. I know we can be better, but no one's really expecting us to be, right? We, we've kind of hit a plateau almost where everybody's just satisfied. And, uh, you know, and, and to me, that's frustrating because I want to keep trying. Like the, when we did mob programming, we were at that point where let's try something different. And we did and we liked it and we delivered quickly. But the team itself doesn't seem to be motivated to improve. What advice can you give me here? Yeah, so it's not really a holacracy question, but man, it's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I could say uh, I could say that purpose purpose alignment is important. Mm -hmm. So if the people in the organization are just there for a paycheck, it's hard to really get you know really get the best of them, um, best out of them, <laughs> not get the best of them. Yeah. <laughs> um, to get the, and to get the best out of them, um, the people need to be aligned with the purpose, which means the purpose has to be explicit, has to be written down, and people have to feel like they have uh, the auton well, like they have input on how things go and have actually have the authority to change things. Um, a lot of times, if you just have a great manager, like that works. You know, the manager solicits your feedback and you talk, and they, you know, you've got a benevolent dictator that that takes care of you. And that works really well. Like that's that's the state of the art for lots of of responsive modern teal organizations. Um, holacracy is different because it actually moves that that power out of the manager and into a process, and that that's the big power shift. Um, which I'm not I'm not saying everyone should do that, it, you know, but I think you can take steps towards it. Um, what are your retros like right now? Are you doing retrospectives? Well, so I'm management, so I'm not in those, but I know they don't take long, right? Because uh, we, the way it's set up is we have a, you know, it's, in fact, it'll be tomorrow. We have a, our demo or a, a sprint reviews and then the retro after that and everybody takes off to lunch. So I think that the feeling now is if we, the quicker we get through the retro, the longer the lunch we can have. But, but uh, we made a decision a long time ago. Yeah. That so I'm not, management's not going to be in those things. So I don't really know. Interesting. Maybe you can attend, but not be management and you can't unless you can separate role and soul, right? Yeah. Like I, I don't have my manager hat on. I'm just here to listen. Yeah. And yeah, well, I've tried that. I mean, you know, and, and, and it's hard because ultimately I am their manager, no matter how unmanager I'm trying to be like yeah. for the longest time I, you know, I was playing the role of product owner and, uh, and I remember talking to my colleagues who are much better at this than I am. And they're like, well, you know, or, you know, product owner is great, but, you know, there's a paradox, you know, the product owner needs to be part of the retros, but the manager does not, and you're both. And so I asked the team, I go, well, all right, so, so here's the deal. I, as product owner, I need to be here, but as manager, I need not to be here. What say you? And they both, they kick me off the island. So, uh, right. <laughs> preferred to have, cool. and that's fine. I mean, I kind of I tried to respect that, but now we have a BA who now plays the role of, of uh, product owner and so he's in the retros so but uh, but it still feels a little stale right uh, like zombie scrum i saw that session yeah right <laughs> i i like to i use the term um like agile theater yeah it's kind of like okay we're going through the motions and you know what you get numb to any process yeah. I mean, a few years into holacracy it's it's you get numb to numb to like some of the some of that too i think it's just human nature um, I just think do your best. Yeah. Um, one thing that we do, one thing that might help is to have a bias for change, to say that it's okay to try new things and we're actually going to lose some productivity because we're going to experiment and kind of make that safe and okay. Yeah. Um, but that's kind of all I can offer there. I want to keep this uh, fairly focused on holacracy though. Yeah, that's fine. I'm... Yeah. yeah. Sorry. No, no, no problem. Uh... I'm trying to see who else is here. Cindy, uh, Kyle, you guys have a question for Jonathan. Or Kyle, if you would like to introduce yourself, you're welcome to say hello. Can you hear me? Yep. 
Yeah, uh, so I first heard about Holacracy by reading Adaptive Capacity. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of that book or not, but it oh. it, it mentions Holacracy in there, and it talks about the uh, – so I started reading the book. I haven't gotten right through it too much yet. Um, it's actually available at my local library, but I have to keep returning it before I can get through it. <laughs> <laughs> um but when I was reading objective capacity, it's all talking about, uh, you know, how organization ships its structure, right? And how um, problems today are not solved by the same solution sets that we used to do before. Everything used to be a technical problem, but now with, you know, you'll hear about the VOCA world, right? Everything's volatile, uncertain, ambiguous, and whatever the C stands for. Right. <laughs> um, that we have to have a whole new problem set to solve our problems. And, and these are adaptive problems. And it talks about how to solve adaptive problems and some of the ways to solve adaptive problems, it suggests distributing authority, right? And that's where the holacracy got mentioned and, and talked about that and said, you know, that creative problem solving requires a whole new mindset, a whole new culture, and this is how you go about doing it. And it, it mentioned some organizations, and I'm, I, it wasn't Spotify, but it was there is some orgs, uh, and I, I, I don't know if they're mentioned in the book or maybe by the author, that are actually practicing this. So not Holacracy One, but a few orgs that have actually um, tried to go to this model. Have you heard about any of those? Or? Yeah, yeah. So Z uh, Zappos, the shoe company, the service, the service company that sells shoes, depending on how, how much you listen to them. Yeah. Um, Zappos has been doing it for years. They're kind of the shining example. Um, you know, they're the largest, and they're they're really really progressive with it. Um, Medium might be who you're not Spotify, but Medium is a, a company down in the Bay Area, San Francisco. Um, they were practicing and they stopped. Um, so there, I mean, there are a number of examples. Um, there's a little bakery in Berkeley called uh, Three Stone Hearth that practices holacracy and they make bread. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's it, what's great about holacracy and going back to this thing about having a different system, a different structure to solve the problems. Um, Brian Robertson's the guy that kind of um, discovered invented holacracy. He invented it as a meta system. So it's designed as a framework that you can build other systems on top of. And why that's useful is because the solution to your organization's problem might not be the same as somebody else's, right? Like if you look at the Agile Manifesto, it's very general in terms of what, what it suggests. It just kind of says, you know, let's bias for this instead of that. Uh, let's go in this direction instead of that direction. But it doesn't say you must do two week sprints with a fixed velocity and like, you know, all of, all of these things like, like scrum and, and uh, Kanban emerged from finding out what works in the environment. Um, and so when you have holacracy at play, you can, you can really build on it, right? So we've got this thing called a role. It has accountabilities. It can have domains. Uh, roles form into circles. Circles form into larger circles. Um, and it's like playing with Legos in an organizational development context. Um, and in that way, holacracy is like the operating system. Like I, I know you hear this metaphor, holacracy is like an operating system, but it really is. You, you, you start with it. It's just the beginning. It, it just gives you the language to start to talk about this stuff with people and, and reason about it and codify those systems into something explicit that you can then evolve. Um, and I've actually got a concrete example of this. I was just down at the responsive conference in, um, in Vegas, uh, responsive.org. And that was at the Zappos headquarters, and I saw an amazing presentation by a couple of the Zappos guys. They are implementing a thing called MBD, Market-Based Dynamics. And this is pretty heavy duty. Um, every circle, so they're using Holacracy, they still are, <clears throat> and every circle in their organization has its own balance sheet. It does a profit and loss, and it has to sell its services to other parts of the organization. So they've wow. taken, yeah, it's heavy. They've, they've taken market concepts and they've actually implemented it internally. And this has allowed them to, like an individual at Zappos, you know, a partner at that company, they can come up with a new idea 
and try it out and try to sell it to someone internally. And if that person buys it, they can go energize that and make it a business. And there are actually businesses that have spun out of Zappos. Like they started as like little mini consultancies and now they're external to Zappos and they sell their services back through like regular money versus like Zappos bucks or whatever they're using on their, and they've got an app that manages this. You know, you can create a service and you can put a price on the service and then another circle can buy the service. Um, and so when, a, when, a, when something in the organization gets constrained, um, it's real clear. Like they're, uh, they, had like a, they had an AV team and like they had enough video guys, but only one audio guy. And so the audio guy's energy was on, in heavy demand and, and it was clear to him. He was like, I should just up the price for my audio service here you know, until it becomes intolerable for somebody else. And then maybe there'll be more audio role fillers. Um, so that kind of speaks to this idea of, you know, if only we had the tools, if only we had the primitives to build new forms of organization. Um, and something you hear a lot, people will say, well, okay, well then how does Holacracy do uh, compensation management or hiring and firing or performance reviews? And the, the wonderful answer that all the seasoned Holacracy practitioners give you is, oh, it's, it's not specified. You have to figure it out yourself. Um, but here's the Legos. <laughs> here's the Legos that you can put together and assemble into a structure that will let you do that. Does that help, Kyle? <laughs> yeah, it does. And that leads me kind of into another question that you brought it up with accounting centers is, you know, think about the, uh, the, the traditional way that um, uh, projects get budget, right? That you try to, you budget for a year, you try to get ROI for that budgeting. And, and I'm also trying to read in the whole new balance sheet budgeting. And I, I'm, I was trying to multicast the term for you to ask the question, but th there's a whole new way of budgeting for projects, you know, in an innovative space. Right. So how does holacracy talk about that? You know, if you, if you develop a circle in this team, how do they move forward with the, 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 maybe the funding model to work on what they want to work on? Yeah. So I can tell you just at a very basic level, um, the super circle controls the resources that get allocated to the circle, just like in conventional management. Um, your boss tells you how much you can spend. Um, now, in a more evolved organization, what you see is those those fairly standard things like the super circle you know gives you the priorities or the super circle gives you the budget you see those moved into processes um that's kind of the main the main shift is from people making decisions to those decisions going into processes yeah basically like it just makes it really clear that you get your budget from the super circle and you have to make your case um and these these things called lead links or circle leads they're in the new version they're called circle leads so let's just use the new language um, the circle leads are responsible for prioritization and resource allocation. So it's basically the same. You have to go and pitch someone. You have to say, hey, does it make sense to you to give me half a million dollars to build this thing? And then you just have a conversation about it and they do or they don't. Bye, Cindy. Thanks for coming. Okay. Sorry to have to drop early. I was enjoying it. Feel free to reach out if you want to talk more. Um, yeah, and that's that's one of those things that's just not specified. Holoc oh. Holacracy doesn't have all the answers. And, and I'm actually really glad that it doesn't. Um, there just wouldn't be any space for, for creativity and, and trying new things and, you know, experimenting. Right, agreed. No, no one process does. I, I, I try to learn as much as I can. And I, I kind of go down these spider webs of trying to find things, right? I started with adaptive capacity. That led me into holacracy and that led me into throughput accounting, that, which is what the term I was trying to find out or beyond budgeting. You can you could Google, you'll find it on that. But it, it, but it's how to uh, get that return from investment and how do, we, how do you change things to be more innovative, more creative? So I'm looking to, you know, in any different um, area that I can to find out you know, ideas and concepts for that. And Holacracy was just one that I ran into. And when I saw that you guys were going to speak about it today, I definitely jumped on and it was a great talk. And then this opportunity presented itself. So. <laughs> great. Great. Yeah. Well, this would be a lot less interesting if, if you weren't asking questions. So. <laughs>
So Jonathan, that, that brings up a question that I'm thinking about. Maybe you guys were thinking about this too, but what were the influences to, because I think you mentioned the gentleman who created Holacracy, what, what kind of influenced them? What other things were influencing him? To yeah, so the, the, the story of Holacracy is pretty, pretty interesting. Um, Brian had a company called Ternary Software, and they, they were a development shop. You know, they, they did contract work, made apps. And he was frustrated that everyone kept asking him questions, and he, wanted, he was like, there's got to be a better way to do this. Um, a side note, he's also a really big fan of tabletop gaming and, uh, you know, Dungeons and Dragons and, you know, Catan and all that. And so he's got a very systematic sort of game theory mindset. Um, so he started experimenting with these sorts of concepts at, uh, at Ternary Software. And then from there moved on, um, from there moved on, started Holacracy 1. And I think it wasn't until like constitution well it must have been, it must have been constitution one but there was a certain point where like people would just ask him okay so what are the rules how are we doing this and people got frustrated that like he's his answers would change and it wasn't, wasn't quite wasn't quite clear and that's when the holacracy constitution was born which is this this document that describes how power works you know it describes your freedoms and responsibilities in the organization um and Tom, I completely spaced on your question. What was it again? Yeah, I was just asking about the influences. And, and as you said that, I, I am not a, a Dungeon and Dragons person, but I know some people that are. And I can see how this, you know, the, the having these rules and, and, and structure help, help them kind of think through. Because um, uh, just for instance, one, um, my brother-in-law is a big, he's, he liked Dungeon and Dragons. He likes every like you mentioned tabletop games and i can see where that's helpful to kind of have that understanding okay because it, it's kind of like in life you know when you think about it you know we have some rules but then there's a lot of gray area and that you know that's that's one of those things that can be kind of like you mentioned like with agile the agile manifesto it doesn't really say specifics it gives us kind of a you know kind of some some guidance um, but I think, you know, it's just kind of interesting to see how, what influences uh, some yeah. Of the creators. Yeah. Um, so I think that uh, Holacracy took a lot of influence from Agile in terms of like roles. That's, I think, straight out of Agile, except that we have dynamic roles. So they're not fixed. There's no prescription about how a certain role should behave. It's all based on accountabilities that are custom to each role. So we have dynamic role structure. Um, some of the some of the stuff around circle structure and sort of some of that organic uh, stuff comes from a thing called sociocracy. Um, but sociocracy bi biases heavily towards consensus, where you have to get everyone's agreement. And I, if if anyone who's all smart about sociocracy is watching this, and I'm not doing it justice, I apologize. It's not my area of expertise. Um, but holacracy, instead of biasing for consensus, biases for minimizing harm and optimizing change, um, which means that if somebody has an idea and nobody can give a, a solid reason why it causes harm, we will try the idea. Um, the question to ask yourself is, is it safe enough to try? Which is a really profound question. Um, yeah, so, interesting. So Martin, maybe that's useful. You know, you can invite invite people to try some new things and then say, well, it, let's, uh, let's, let's ask ourselves, is this safe enough to try or, or would it cause harm that we can't uh, adapt to before it's too late? Um, so that's another influence is um, sort, of, sort of biasing towards, towards going fast. We say be a Ferrari. That's kind of the term that we use. Keep that in your mind. If you do an holacracy, okay, I got to be a Ferrari, I, you know, and just stay within the, stay within, stay on the road, stay in the guidelines, but then you can go as fast as you want. Um, let me think. There are some more influences. Um, Agile, definitely. Sociocracy to some extent. I guess probably just game theory and gaming in general. Um, one example I want to share there is, specifically, it's useful if you are a power holder. So if you run a circle, you run a team, and you're thinking, okay, I want to make this more decentralized, and I want to give people more autonomy. So I'm going to write a policy. Um, maybe it'll be around spending money. Uh, if the amount is less than $20, uh, you can just spend it. Um, but if the amount is, is between 20 and 100, 
Um, I guess you should announce that you can spend it and then wait if see if anybody com objects and then you can spend it. But if it's more than a hundred, let's tell us like a thousand. Um, now, now I want you to get permission, right? So there's there's some game theory involved. So now you can write a uh, a marriage advice book, Jonathan, using Holacracy. Oh God. <laughs> well, I'm naive about a lot of things, and marriage <laughs> is definitely one of them. <laughs> Oh, but th this is super interesting. So one of my colleagues, former colleagues, um, whenever I talk to him about, you know, kind of what he, what he got out of Holacracy, what he learned, he says, you know, it didn't, ch it didn't influence how I work nearly as much as it influenced my relationship with my partner. Because now I have, now I, I can talk about what's mine and what's theirs, like energetically, not just like property, but, you know, my is this my tension or is it your tension and of course i want to help you with your tension but i don't want to you know fall into it and identifying needs and that, that gets into like uh nonviolent communication um it's just it's really a journey once once you start really getting into this stuff it, it's a lot more than just you know how do we do our work together what about um i guess let's see i, I just want to ask if everybody what are their questions people have for Jonathan. Tim, do you want to, do you have any curiosities or, or is there anything you're noticing about this? Uh, no, well, I, I like it. So like, is it for, for whatever reason, my, my initial feeling about this, right. And it's changed. So it's, you know, it's, so it doesn't, doesn't always come with an open embrace is uh, it seemed it would, like I mentioned earlier for bigger teams, right. You know, you have to have enough people to have a big enough circle. Now, you've already kind of convinced me that that's not the case. And so maybe the small team is the best way to approach this and get bigger over time. If that's the case, um, you know, I, am willing to experiment with something like this. Like I mentioned earlier, before we started the session, we, we just did a mob programming experience right. their experiment and that seemed to work. So I don't want to keep changing, you know, like juggling <laughs> different things for different, for people to try. So, I may look into this down the road, right? This may, let's, sure. let, let's let mob go for a while, see how that goes. Everyone seems to be excited. It's the most energy my team's seen in a long time. So uh, I don't want to poke that bear. So uh, I'm going to let it ride, but uh, I am going to do a little more research on this because yeah, I'm very green here. I don't know anything about it yet. yet. That's, well, that, that's, also, that's also a good mindset to maintain because you won't learn if you don't, you know, if, if you think you know everything, you're not going to learn much. Yeah. Um, Regarding mob programming specifically, I got to say it is a really nice way to bring people together. Um, and Holacracy doesn't talk a lot about what to do with the people and how, you know, how to help them be more alive at work. That's, that's the concern of a role. If that's an issue, create a role for it and let the role solve the tensions around how to make the team have good energy. Um, in, in some sense, Holacracy can come off as pretty cold because it's really about org structure. It's not about, um, you know, having great communication and everyone being nice to each other and empathetic listening and compassion and mindfulness and like all these buzzwords that we, we hear and then nobody does anything with, you know, it's, it's more, of this, more of this theater. Um, Holacracy gives you concrete rules to follow and by virtue of following the rules, then, then things start to change. Um, I would say, yeah, if something's working, keep doing it. Um, and there was something I wanted to say around dissent, enlightened dissent. This is kind of a concept that I'm cultivating and learning about, um, and sort of discovering on my own. The idea of, um, in a healthy organization, it should be safe to have a dissenting view, you know, and if people are walking around pissed off, great let them be pissed off and let them be let them you know let them dissent actively like you know they can say i think this process sucks and there should be a place for them to say that without fear of retribution or fear of them not belonging to the group uh and that takes a lot of safety like a lot you know we, th we throw around the term psychological safety and i just i think that when we when you call it psychological safety it sort of takes something out of it it's safety um so what I loved about working at Holacracy One is the enlightened dissent. Um, it's not like everyone was walking around pissed off all the time. People were very happy and it was really great. And I did some of my best work there. 
And there are times when things go sideways and people get upset and they're, it's, it's okay. It's not, it's bad, bad feelings aren't dangerous. And I think the reason that you can have bad feelings is because, have bad feelings and not have it be dangerous, is because your belonging's not at risk because there are rules. You're following the rules, right? You're not beholden to somebody who's going to judge you for everything you say or do, which is, I think, how it is in conventional organizations. You know, go along to get along and don't rock the boat and cover your ass. Um, but it's a huge mindset shift, and it is dangerous to do that, you know, to, to, to drop into an organization that's all command and control and politics driven and to say, OK, tomorrow when you come in, you know, I want you all to own your autonomy and uh, be a Ferrari. And like it's a nuanced thing to actually implement this stuff, but it's possible. Another quick question. Uh, so if we did want to experiment with this, uh, Jonathan, do we do we seek a coach? Do we just try on our own? I mean, uh, what do you recommend? So you can do a DIY. It's pretty hard. Um, a lot of the there's a there's a DIY guide on the Holacracy website. Um, if you can get a coach, that's definitely the best way to go. Usually, just to give you an outline of the process, usually you start with uh, what's called a circle structuring meeting. So you basically just do an initial circle structuring and structuring, and you write down your roles. Um, you write down the roles and the accountabilities of each person. You assign them into the roles. And now you've got something that kind of reflects reality. It reflects what you're already doing. And then you start with tactical meetings. And there's a process for that. And that's where it's really handy to have a good coach. Um, uh, what's the word? A, a facilitator in Holacracy is more like a referee than like your conventional idea of a facilitator. It, it's like a, it's like imagine that you're that you're at a at a traffic light and the traffic lights out and there's a cop standing there and he's just directing traffic. And he doesn't care. Yeah, exactly. He doesn't care who you are, where you're going. He just wants things to flow. You know, he's acting in the, in everyone's best interest. That's the mindset of a good holacracy facilitator. It's neutrality and it's fairness. Um, so yeah, you can start with tactical meetings. Uh, I mean, start doing at a minimum, just start doing, um, check-in rounds and closing rounds for all your meetings. Just check in and say, what's on your mind. And at the end, say, talk about how the meeting went. And that alone can start to loosen things up and you don't have to change how power works and you don't have to switch from demands to requests, you know, requests, um, but that can be a safe way to just just dip your feet into it. And then, yeah, if you want to get serious, um, get a coach. I'd be happy to offer a little bit of advice if I can. Um, the tactical meeting format, I mean, if you're already a technical team, you're already doing sprints, and that's great. Um, if you're not a technical team, if you're like a HR team or people ops or marketing or finance, uh, I would highly recommend starting tactical meetings uh, just because it's such a civil way to have a meeting. <laughs> Um, the, it's, I like to call it the last meeting format you'll ever need, which is a total lie, but I just love it. Um, because, well, let's talk about tactical meetings. We've got a minute. Um, a tactical meeting just breaks down what you do in a normal meeting into discrete chunks. So you do your check-in and then you do your checklists and metrics. And that's where you just get, get a pulse on the health of the circle. And that can be, you know, website visit visitors or balance sheet or whatever the circle cares about. You know, number of customers that walked through the front door this week, whatever it is. And then people hear those things and that might create tensions for their roles. They might say, oh, our attendance is really down. I have a tension now. And then later on in the meeting, there's a place to process that. You go through all your projects. It's like a sprint review. And then you do triage. That's where anybody can bring anything. There's no agenda ahead of time. You just bring issues and go through them one at a time. And um, people take projects. They say, yes, that makes sense to me. I'll take a project for that. And that's the end of the meeting. And then you do your closing around and reflect and go on about your day. Um, and in that way, it's also very much like, like when you leave those meetings, you're not taking baggage with you. You're not thinking, oh, God, that guy, why did he drag on so long? Because you're, you're there in service of a role. It's, it's a very different experience. Um, 
so please make the world a better place and do tactical meetings. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of a, kind of a rant. Two things, just one short question real quick. How long does it take to do the closing round? Cause I think we obviously want to do one, but, and then I had another question if we yeah. had time. Um, so we, for the five of us, we can probably get a closing round done in two minutes at the most. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Well, I'm just, I just want to ask you a question and then hopefully somebody else will have something else. But you mentioned Jonathan that <clears throat> sometimes it fails. So tell us, you know, what have you seen? What are some of the causes? Like if we, you know, yeah, so that's like, that's a whole, that's a whole great conversation to have. Um, it's really hard. We're, we're changing the way power works and it's just so very different from what people are used to. Um, a lot of people are really, um, a lot of people have a lot of their identity tied up in their job and in their roles. And when you do holacracy, you really have to get, uh, you really have to be strong in yourself and not value your power over others, right? Like, cause that changes. Um, so a lot of people don't like it. It takes a lot more work to get, to like get someone to internalize your goal and agree with it. Like there's a lot more convincing going on. Um, and so in that way you, you really have to become a better communicator. Like it forces you to grow as a communicator. Um, it's also really hard to hire sometimes into a traditional, like if you when you switch to holacracy and I think medium went through this, it's very hard to hire for jobs when there's no like job description exactly there's no title it's not like we need a director and you're going to be a director and you get all the privileges that go with being a director it's like no here here's some accountabilities this is what you do and people want to get hired in for the, for the prestige right they, they want a high-powered job um they want control over others they've got oh, i've got 25 direct reports i've got 500 direct reports um that's Water a office yeah Right. And now, now these are all tensions, right? You can, you can create a role that's responsible for allocating office layout. Great. It's going to force you to think it through in a, you know, it's going to force you to really put attention on it and to like live with the decisions that somebody else is making, which you already are. Um, but it really gives clarity. Like if there's something it biases towards it's clarity. Uh, so in terms of why holacracy adoptions fail, man, that is like a whole workshop in itself. Um, and it's also something I don't know a ton about because I've had the, the delight of working in a really highly functioning uh, holacracy. What about this? If you go in, so, and I don't know if you guys, if you did this at holacracy one or you did this, you do this now, but like you're doing an assessment. So you come into say, you know, the rest of us are in a company, you come in and assess us. Is there anything that you can see? Well, you know, the way Tom and Tim and Kyle and Martin work, Totally. That might yeah. be a red flag that this might be hard for you guys to, to work. With. Yeah. So the, the first thing is that the, the power holder really has to be vested in it. If, if the power holder it thinks it's some weird thing and you're just going to try it for a while, whatever their position is, and this is true in any organization, right? Whatever position the power holder has filters down into how everyone behaves, how everyone thinks. So you really need the power holder to be, um, to be, strong in their determination that like, we're going to try this, we're going to do it by the rules. And there's even a little um, ratifying agreement. And I'm really into working agreements, which we didn't get to talk about much. Um, but there's a ratifying agreement that when you start doing the process, the power holder and Tim, this could be you if you're in charge of your team, you could just say, I declare that we're going to do we're going to follow these rules for how we work together. And I'm going to follow these rules too. And there's no other rules. And that gives everyone the safety. And then you also reserve the right to just turn off the pro program, pull the plug, you know, go back to the old way, but you don't have the right to do a mixture. You don't have the right to like sometimes follow the rules and sometimes push, push through your will. Um, and that's a place where people falter and fail. Um, and you know, it just, it, it exposes a lot of dysfunction. And so if you're just, already kind of dysfunctional and kind of just getting along, like things might get worse. In fact, things often do get worse for a while until they get better. Yeah. 
Now, do you see a concern that it's management that keeps bringing these ideas up? I mean, right, I'm, I'm the only one on my team in this conference right now, I almost guarantee it, because I love this stuff. But uh, yeah. I would love for someone else to recommend holacracy. <laughs> well, so I can, yeah, yeah, totally. I, I came at it from the individual contributor side, not from the management side. Um, I was I was sick of just being a developer and just like the only way I could contribute was to sit in a room and take stories off a backlog and write commits like that was drudgery to me and I and through the process I moved from development into coaching and eventually my my organizational fit my fit with the organization shifted so much that it didn't make sense for me to stay because the organization needed a developer that's what I was getting paid for and I was you know and so for me, there was a transition there, and it, that was okay. It's healthy, right? I wouldn't be here if I if I didn't get that the opportunity to do that. So, you can't sell it. I mean, you can declare that you're doing it. You shouldn't really have to sell it. But ideally, if people want more autonomy and a, and more authority, this is a great way to do it. Um, I mean, you can you can offer the, offer them. You know, show them the te- show them Brian's TED talk. It's twenty minutes. Um, you know, it's a lot of it is just around showing people that there's a better way and then people get curious. And But part of it is that as soon as you start to think there might be a better way, now you have to deal with the reality of your current situation and that can be bad news. You know, whenever you face a big change in life or a big realization or epiphany or like grow in some wonderful way, you look back and say, oh man, like that was hard before. And that's where we are right now. So there's there's an element of uh, of personal sort of reflection in that. Well, I think we're about at our end time here. Why don't you start us off kind of with a closing round, and then we can, uh, and if you have anything uh, after that, we can share. Yeah. So before I do the closing round, I'm gonna do a little pitch. Um, I have a product called Teal Dog, Teal T E A L dot D O G. It's a website, and uh, it's a product for um, running or an organization with uh, circles and roles. It's just like Glassfrog, but it's much more lightweight and I think easier to use. Um, Glassfrog is better for like large implementations. Teal Dog is designed for like the small team. And it also has a big working agreement component where you can create a working agreement and request people to agree to it and they can agree or not. And it stores them all in there for you. Um, so please check out Teal Dog. It's still super beta. I'm just working on it. Um, I basically needed to build something to support the people that I'm working with, my clients. Like there was no tool that was right for the small teams that I want to work with. So I built Teal Dog to, to, to solve that tension. Um, and then, yeah, check out my YouTube channel. And um, if you have any ideas, if you ever want to come on and just like, if you want to do a deep dive and do a video, like I love talking about this stuff. It really jazzes me up. I spend 20% of my time on outreach and um, information and teaching just for free because I love it. Um, so please, if you're curious, like let's let's get more of this stuff going in the world. Um, you know, you can make as much money as you want, but it doesn't mean you'll be happy. And this is what brings me happiness. That was a great closing. I really enjoyed uh, hanging out with you guys. It's really a privilege, um, and I'm happy to talk more soon. Tom, you want to go ahead? Thank you. Thank you. How do, how do we uh, close out the, the closing round? Tell me how to do that. Um, you just say thanks for coming and then you leave the meeting. Uh, okay. So I thought maybe we, do we don't go around and say... Oh, no, no. Right. We, you do a round. Everyone reflects. The, the idea with the closing is to reflect on how the past hour went, mm-hmm. how the meeting went, what you got out of it, what you didn't, sure. what you wish would have happened. And that serves as a little tiny mini retrospective for every single meeting you have, hmm. which is... excellent. Nice. Yeah. Excellent. I will, you want me to go? Yes, please. So I really enjoyed the the meeting and the time. I guess I just want to make a confession as I think some of the other people were doing a little multitask and I was doing some things too and I shouldn't have been, um, but I did enjoy and learn a lot. I did like how we kind of went on, uh, I know in our talk, I was trying to remember what we covered and I tried not to ask questions about things we covered in our, our talk before. And I think we covered kind of some new areas there and I really I really appreciated that and what you shared, Jonathan. And I do appreciate your time as well. Cool. Thanks. Jim, do you give a closing? Yeah, sure. I, uh, so I, I took a few notes of what I'm going to look up. So it looks like Glass Frog will have like kind of walk you through it. And I'm looking forward to looking at Teal Dog as well. 
Uh, I like uh, the term separation of roles and souls. <laughs> I jotted that down. That sounded intriguing to me. And I'm going to check out Brian's uh, Holacracy's uh, TED Talk just to kind of get a better understanding before and then maybe introduce it to some members of the team and see what they think about it. But yeah, I had fun. This was fantastic. Thank you. Kyle? Sorry, two mutes, one on the thing and one on my mic. <laughs> yeah. um, so what I got out of it is, you know, I guess I had a little bit more background than some of the other participants, and so it was good. And, uh, and I, I had to try to get back into that book a little bit more and go through things. But the thing that key interested me is, you know, how to build teams, right, and an agile team and a high-performing adaptive team, right? And the whole thing that I liked about it in, in, is that um, – Tim talked about is that role and soul thing, right? Is is you have that ten person team, but holacracy really kind of gives you that structure, right? And those rules and how to come to agreements, right? The one thing I, I have to clarify with you a little bit more, maybe at another time, is the whole consens consensus versus you know, as you said, extraining your will. What I kind of got out of the book was, you know consensus is not necessarily a good thing. We want to say, okay, everybody gets to speak their mind. Everybody gets a vote. Everybody gets to listen. But if ultimately I'm, I'm accountable, I'm going to make the decision because I have that authority. So it seems like there is a little bit of enforcement of your will. And if, if you structure a high-performing team, it doesn't seem you want to have a whole bunch of uh, alpha males or alpha females on the team. <laughs> you know, it could be a, a wrongly structured team. And I guess maybe holacracy kind of uh, maybe will – set those rules and those guidelines with those different dynamics of individuals. Great. Thank you. Martin? Martin, you want to give a closing? We'll give it one or two more seconds. Okay. That's good enough for me. Thanks, everyone. It's a privilege. Feel free to reach out. Thank um, you, Jonathan. Thank you, everybody else. Appreciate it. Okay, bye-bye.